Now let's cross the pond back to North America and talk about arguably the most important central bank out there. Given the importance of the US dollar as a reserve currency, the magnitude of the US economy, and the impact on US rates on the world, it's no surprise that the Federal Reserve is keenly watched by all market participants. Their monetary policy not only shapes their domestic market, but also shapes the global economy. The trickle-down effects of their policies impact how U.S. banks interact with borrowers and savers, and during the last global financial crisis in 2008 under Ben Bernanke, it can be argued that their coordination with other global central banks and the policies that arose saved the world economy from a far worse fate. But as for the Federal Reserve itself, less people are aware of the structure of the bank. As shown here, the Federal Reserve System is made up of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks, named after the locations of their headquarters, and they're the operating arms of the central bank. Under the original Federal Reserve Act, all U.S. national banks must be a member of one of the 12 regional Federal Reserve banks and subscribe to 3% of their own capital as stock in the respective Federal Reserve Bank. State banks may join if they meet certain criteria. And regardless of whether a financial institution is a member or not, all of the roughly 20,000 depository institutions in the U.S. are subject to the Fed's regulations, including reserve requirements. This archaic stock ownership requirement still remains today amongst the 3,000 American commercial banks that are members and have led to ambiguity and conspiracies about the Fed's independence and legal status. These stocks pay a small dividend out of the Federal Reserve's bank's earnings, but are otherwise very different from normal common stock. They do not have voting status. They cannot be freely bought or sold, nor borrowed against. The member banks do not get to decide on the directors of the Federal Reserve Banks and have no ownership on the surplus or assets of the Federal Reserve Banks. So these shares are strictly symbolic. The main governing body of the Fed is known as the Board of Governors, and that's led by the Chair and the Vice Chair. In addition to that, there are seven governors who also sit on the Fed's Open Market Committee, known as the FOMC. We'll take a look at these two important groups next. First, let's look at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. This board is comprised of seven members or governors who are nominated by the President and confirmed in, in their position by the U.S. Senate. The market pays attention to speeches by all governors, as well as the voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee and non-voting Federal Reserve Bank Presidents in order to get a read on the future direction of the Fed. Key events to pay extra attention to are the Chair of the Federal Reserve's Semi-Annual Monetary Policy Report to Congress, which is known as the Humphrey Hawkins Report, as well as the annual speech at the Jackson Hole Fed Symposium, also by the Chair. Now let's look at the arguably the most famous part of the Fed, the Fed Open Market Committee, or the FOMC for short. The FOMC decides on the policy rates of the U.S. Central Bank, hence their importance. Twelve voting members of the FOMC consist of the seven members of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, the President of the Federal Reserve Board of New York always serves on the Open Market Committee, and four of the remaining 11 Reserve Bank Presidents take turns on a rotating one-year term serving on the FOMC. They meet eight times a year. Uh, roughly every six weeks to decide on the committee's target for the Fed funds rate and other policy rates. A two-day meeting results in a vote. The vote may not be unanimous, but majority rules and dissenters are noted in the FOMC statement. After all meetings, market watchers pore over the FOMC statements to find any carefully worded changes and interpret the tone of the statement. We'll have an exercise later so that you can try also to interpret the tone of an FOMC statement. After its introduction in 2011, the FOMC releases a dot plot after certain meetings. The dot plot anonymously tracks all of the 19 voting and non-voting members' expectations for the range of future interest rates in subsequent years and in the long run. Given that the FOMC advertises itself as being data dependent, the dots and the changes from each release to the next gives us the expected direction of rate movements, whether they are looser or tighter.
At 2 p.m. Eastern Time on the second day of the FOMC, the FOMC releases all of their policy rates, which we'll discuss next. The first and most famous of these is the target federal funds rate, known in the market as the Fed Funds rate or simply as Fed Funds. This is the rate that the Fed targets as a lending rate between member depository institutions on an unsecured basis to ensure that they meet reserve requirements. In other words, money still held at the Fed to maintain reserve requirements. Keep in mind that while the FOMC sets a range for this rate, the actual rate is calculated using volume-weighted data on overnight federal funds transactions provided by domestic banks and the U.S. branches and agencies of foreign banks. This sort of lending and borrowing is quite commonplace as end-of-day balances at member depository institutions will fluctuate. The next rate is the discount rate. It's technically three different rates, known as the primary, credit, secondary credit, and seasonal credit rates. But for our purposes, we're going to lump them all together. This rate is the rate that the Fed would charge member institutions to deal with very short-term shortages of liquidity in meeting reserve requirements. Keep in mind that this is on a collateralized basis, and it's via a lending channel called the discount window. As the Fed wants depository institutions to exhaust all other funding avenues before using the discount window, the three rates are always higher than the Fed Fund's targets rates. It's about 50 basis points higher for primary credit and about 100 basis points higher for secondary and seasonal borrowing. The difference between primary and secondary credit is the credit worthiness of the borrowing member institution, and both types of credits are for very short term, mostly overnight. Seasonal credit, on the other hand, can be longer term, and they're for member institutions that experience large seasonal swings in loans and deposits. This sort of borrowing is less common through the discount window as there's a stigma in the marketplace for using that window. The last set of rates are the IORR and the IOER. The IORR means interest on reserve, uh, required reserve balances, and the IOER stands for interest on excess balances. These are types of interest that are, the Fed pays on required reserve balances and on excess reserve balances deposited by member institutions at the Fed. This was introduced after the GFC in, in October 2008, and these two rates are meant to help stabilize the other monetary instruments the Fed has, because during the crisis, member banks had placed so much of their money as excess reserves at the Fed, rather than lend the money in normal course of business, that it created pressure on the Fed funds rate lower than the target. These rates, although serving different functions ha and have two different names, IOER and IORR, are actually both the same numerical value. So this is a graph showing the four rates from Bloomberg. There are three things I want you to note here. Number one, you can see that rates move in 25 basis point increments. In rare circumstances, we may see moves in multiples of 25 basis points, but that tends to only happen in extreme occurrences. Also, the three rates tend to move in lockstep. The second one, is that given the Fed wants member institutions to borrow amongst themselves first, the discount rate in yellow lies above the federal funds rate in white by 50 basis points, as we talked about. And that's for primary credit. Secondary credit would be 100 basis points, and so would seasonal credit. Lastly, the IORR and the IOER rates lie below the federal funds rate, effectively providing a floor. Uh, this is at 1.55 at the moment, at the end of 2019, which is five basis points more than the range of Fed funds at the same time frame. This floor means that even in times of excess liquidity in the banking system, member institutions are only incentivized to lend out to other member institutes at rates above the IOER slash IORR floor. Otherwise, they would rationally choose to park those excess cash reserves at the Fed and earn the IOERIORR rate. As mentioned in the earlier slide, the value of both of these rates is the same. And you can see that they're both 1.55 at the end of 2019.
So far we've talked extensively about our interpretation of the FOMC's tone. Given the importance of the statement, many experts obviously pay careful attention as well. Here we have a screen grab on a Bloomberg screen showing the last eight FOMC meetings and the results of each, including the unscheduled FOMC action on March the 3rd as a result of the COVID-19 infections globally. You can see that Bloomberg produces a survey of the experts' forecast of the Fed Fund's target under the BN survey column. There generally doesn't tend to be many outliers, as these forecasters adjust their forecasts as consensus builds closer to the economic release date. There is also more commonality since the Fed pledged to increase transparency in the wake of the global financial crises of 2007-2008. In addition to the actual policy decision, market watchers also pay careful attention to the release of the FOMC minutes that come out three weeks after the meeting. The minutes are laid out as follows. Section 1 contains a list of the attendees. Section 2 contains an overview of economic and financial conditions and its information provided to the committee by the staff of the Federal Reserve System. Section 3 contains the perspectives of meeting participants and that normally goes under the heading of Participants' Views on Current Conditions and the Economic Outlook. Lastly, this, uh, Section 4 contains the Policy Decision, and that's under the heading of Committee Policy Action. So as I may have mentioned before, uh, most of the market uses the Bloomberg platform. Bloomberg is a integrated pricing analytics news source that most of the uh, market participants on the street use. It's also a great way to find information on central bank uh, policy rates as well as forecasts. So now let me show you, first of all, how we find information on the Fed. So on the Bloomberg screen, we would actually go into the FOMC screen. That's the Fed Open Market Committee. And it shows you all the meetings that will be scheduled for the balance of the year. So in this case, 2020. Uh, for meetings that have already happened, it will tell you what the rate outcome was, how many people voted for this rate, and how many voted against. Now, these two will come out from the minutes of the FOMC rather than from the FOMC um, statement itself. Uh, we had a rate decision yesterday, and it was a surprise. Uh, the market had not anticipated the Fed to cut 50 basis points. And it was also done at a different time, which you can see here. And based on this, by clicking on it, you can actually see where the experts had forecasted it. And they had uh, forecasted pretty much unchanged. And nobody had anticipated the uh, cut to 1%. This is a list of all the uh, economists on the street that contribute to Bloomberg with respect to their calls on the FOMC. And you can see that there were 26 estimates for this particular uh, data release. Now, if we want to go and examine more of the Fed, let's go back to the FOMC screen there. And you can click on FOMS, and that would give you the statement, as well as the minutes when they're released. Next, let's look at the speech calendar. And as I mentioned, central bankers' speeches are really quite important because they do give the market indication of the way that the central bank is leaning. Uh, it doesn't matter if the governor is a voting or non-voting member, as both are equally important. As you know, uh, voting members will rotate on every year. And the last thing I want to show you is the page itself on Bloomberg for the Fed, which is simply FED. So you can either click on here, number 27, or in the menu bar, Fed Go. And this gives you all the information regarding the Fed. It tells you when the next policy decision is. It tells you what the rates are at the moment. It tells you the discount rate. And if you click on any of these, I'll give you the actual statements, the side-by-side -side statements, as well as the rest of the economic um, statistics for the U.S. as well.